Malgaris. And we're from Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire, from the Trust Lab, working under Professor Sergey Bardas. What we're going to talk to you about today is a self-assessment framework for Zigbee. And as Joshua Wright, who was able to make it, says, uh, security will not get better until tools for practical exploration of the attack surface are made available. He'd like this to be called Wright's Law, so we'll try to go with that today. Woo! Thank you, Josh. Yeah. So some of our work that we're going to go through is first the sniffing devices. How do we actually collect data? Then we're going to be talking about some of the patches we've made to his Killer Bee framework. Talk about our online database logging schema, which you'll see why that's important later. We've developed a .15d4 extension to Scapey for packet building and dissection. Also ZBForge, which is a library for device and link analysis and inferencing, working with that database schema. And then some of the devices and uh, techniques we're looking at for actually interacting back through jamming and packet injection. So uh, before we get started, we're just going to do a quick review of some terms. Our work centers around 802.15.4 and Zigbee. 802.15.4 specifies the physical and max sublayer specifications for low rate wireless personal area networks. LRWPAN is aimed at providing low data rate, low cost, low power, and low complexity connectivity. Zigbee sits on top of 802.15.4 and provides routing and an application framework at the upper layers. So why do we care about 802.15.4 and Zigbee? It's because these are devices that are interacting with the physical environment deployed in real world applications. Zigbee Alliance, which is the organization responsible for promoting the technology, says that they want it to connect in a match range of simple and high-tech devices. And they're doing quite well at this. They're doing quite well at proliferating this technology. On the right here are the different fields it's being deployed in, from building automation which eight, with uh, HVAC systems in large buildings and hotels, process automation, smart energy with power meters, uh, healthcare mainly in the monitoring field, home automation going in, you know, proliferating into your homes to control theaters, lighting, sprinklers, and my favorite, security systems, uh, and some others here. But what you and I might call these are really attack surfaces. And that's why this is an interesting technology, because it exposes so many different surfaces uh, to attack. So I wish we could go through today, but we can't in 20 minutes talk about the, the specs in depth. We're happy to talk with anyone after to give them, you know, more information. This is the general media access control frame at the top. You see the frame control field, which is split out below, your sequence number, addressing. If you guys have looked at packets before, this is looking sort of uh, the same, right? Um, the data frame just has a payload. The FCS at the end, it's important to note, is a non-cryptographic frame control sequence just in two bytes. The command frame adds a byte to identify the type of command you're sending. Where it starts to get messier is with beacon frames. The stuff in the blue boxes, we haven't even tried to split out and, and fit on the slide. Um, but you'll see you get the optional security header, the super frame specification, GTS field specifications, and then pending address fields, which are there to tell devices that want to go to sleep when they wake up if there's data waiting for them. Uh, all the targets you've seen all over these are, are fields that we feel are very interesting to mess around with and, and see what happens to devices. And, I had fun with copy and paste a lot there. So uh, just so you can get an idea of what Zigbee networks look like, uh, the Zigbee networking layer offers uh, star and mesh topologies. You will typically find three types of devices in a Zigbee network. You have your coordinator, which is responsible for starting the network, and initializing and maintaining devices on the network. You have your coordinator, which extends the network and moves data and control messages. And finally, you have your end devices, which communicate with the coordinator. In terms of security, and this is a small portion, but you will find three types of encryption keys being used. Link keys are used to secure unicast communication between two devices. Network keys are used to secure broadcast communication, so all devices are going to contain the same network key on the network. And finally, you have a master key, which is used to derive the link key. So what we'd like to do before going on to some of the changes we made is point out what's been done in the past. First, uh, Joshua Wright from InGuardians developed the original Killer Bee framework. Travis Goodspeed, who's here somewhere, Travis, uh, has done a lot of local key extraction work. Uh, Akiba from Freak Labs uh, is developing an open source Zigbee stack, but also has developed uh, one of the circuit boards we'll be using today. 
and Kevin Finisterre from Ohio has done some practical war driving work uh, in this regard. So let's start with the hardware that you need uh, in order to work with this stuff. First is the RZ USB stick. You see two of them here. This is what Josh originally supported in uh, Killaby. But the hardware is unfortunately limited in the fact that it has a printed circuit board antenna. So your ranges and uh, options for antennas are sort of limited. So let's look at the Tmote Sky, which uh, by putting your own tiny OS code on it that we've written, and by moving this really tiny capacitor you see there, and adding an SMA jack, uh, you can add directional antennas or whatever you want. Uh, very similarly goes for the Zena Packet Analyzer. You again need to move this tiny capacitor that's not documented and the tech support doesn't like talking to you about. Um, this has a closed framework. It's uh, more useful for sniffing than injection, but we're looking at that as well. Okay, now one of my favorite platforms that I've worked with a lot is uh, the Freaktuino Chibi. This is from Freak Labs Akiba uh, over in Japan. It's an Arduino clone, so something you guys might be familiar with the programming environment for, uh, with an Atmel RF-230 radio chip attached to the SPI bus. So by modifying some libraries and adding our own code, and also adding a special shield, we developed a special type of device we're calling the ZB plant. Our goal here was to develop an 802.15.4 sniffer that was low profile, independent of a computer, and that it could log data and retrieve it later, self-powered, uh, and able to do some location capture. So what we get is this. It's the first prototype. We have it here. You can play around with it. It's ugly. I apologize. Um, and we basically modified the stack for promiscuous capture. Akiba's actually now added a flag after we talked to him about this. Uh, GPS is on board that little green and white box. There's an EEPROM memory logger up to 4 mig uh, megabits on the I2C bus to leave your SPI bus open for uh, radio communications. Then we added some switches, uh, push buttons, LED indicators to allow you to configure it in the field while also allowing you to turn off those LEDs for uh, power saving purposes. So. so one of the other hardware platforms that we've been playing around with is the USRP2. If you don't know what a software defined radio is, the idea is that uh, components typically implemented in hardware, such as amplifiers, mod mod demodulators, et cetera, are instead uh, implemented in software on the host computer. This means that you define signal processing blocks for handling uh, your incoming signal. This makes the USRP and RF Swiss Army of Swords, which we've coupled with UCLA's 802.15.4 demodulation framework. Uh, it was originally written for the SRP, but we ported it to work on the USRP2 and with the latest release of GNU Radio. So what are we using the USRP2 for? We're using it for selective jamming. Uh, continuous RF jamming has always been there, but what selective jamming does is target specific transmissions or frames, if you will. This has two advantages. Uh, the first is that you're active for a less period of time, so use less energy. And the second one is that it allows you to operate covertly. It won't be obvious to the network operator that you're jamming their network you only have to activate your jammer for a couple of microseconds long enough to flip a bit or two. So target, and sorry, uh, additionally, most spectrum analyzers out there are gonna have a difficult time seeing this because they have to sweep across the frequency range, which they can only do to the best, uh, to about 40 milliseconds. Targets for jamming are AX, which there's an example right there of. Jamming acts will cause congestion on the network because packets have to be retransmitted. Jamming association responses will cause a denial of service because the device can't join the network. This is our selective jamming architecture. We implemented the traffic recognizer and transmitter path components. What our traffic recognizer does is look at enough, look at an incoming packet uh, byte by byte and once we have enough bytes to identify it as a target, we activate our jammer. So this is what a normal association sequence should look like. Uh, once, the network, once a device finds a network, it sends an associate request command to the router, at which point the router responds with an association response indicating whether it was successful or not, which in most cases it should be successful. What we have here is a device trying to join a racket, a network, and the first red 
frame that you saw is actually an association request, but what we're doing is jamming the association response, so the device keeps trying to associate the, to the network without any luck. There are some limitations to the SRP, uh, namely there is a considerable amount of latency between the USRP and host computer, which makes it difficult to jam packets in real time. Uh, what we're doing right now is jamming packets that we are expecting based on packets that we've already received. Uh, we've been talking to Michael Osman and Travis Goodspeed about this, but we're looking to, we want to move towards a microcontroller hardware platform. Specifically, we're looking at the CC2430, which gives you a byte by byte packet view of an incoming packet. This differs from other radio chips that buffer the entire packet before giving it to you. Uh, additionally, you will, want, you will want to turn a carrier sense and collision avoidance off, as that will defeat the purpose. Okay, so now that we've looked at some of the hardware that we're using, let's look at some of the modifications to the code that we've done. Um, the first is a driver model basically to support multiple devices. Now that you've seen we're using a variety of hardware, we want to sort of fluidly support these. We're also doing location and time stamping as close to the actual frame capture as possible. Uh, then we're doing live logging to a database schema. You can see part of the schema over on the right there. Um, and the idea behind this is to correlate from multiple uh, retrieving devices to generate a whole, uh, you know, an overall picture of your network. Also some additional tools like ZB War Drive we're making which allow you to, uh, instead of dedicating a capture device if you have a limited number to every single channel then having to go through and see which ones interest you, uh, it will detect which uh, channels there's actually networks operating on and dynamically assign devices while there's uh, traffic on there to capture it. Okay, so the next tool is our scapey.15d4 extension. This is basically, we want an easy way to rip apart packets, we want an easy way to reassemble them. You don't want to have to write byte by byte if you're doing a security assessment in the field to specify what these packets should have in them. So we had to create a few new fields and then we, we have a lot of packet types, we're adding more of these. We support acts, data, uh, beacon frames, command frames, and then a, uh, a, some of the command specifics now like coordinated realignment, which is a fairly complex frame. So the idea behind this is this is the beacon frame we saw before, and here's, just to show you, all the stuff that uh, comes out in the spec as subfields of that. And then all these yellow arrows are the different relationships between different fields that you need to take into account so that they're tied together. Well, at least I'm not going to be able to keep this in my head and write a packet in the field if I'm doing a pen test. So we moved on to the extension. Let's take a look at how we do the same thing. Let's initialize escapey instance of a beacon set the sequence number to something, turn on the frame control field security bit, which will then add in your auxiliary security header like it should automatically. Uh, if you set the source address to something, for example, it'll also set the frame control field source addressing mode based on the proper length. You fire up a killerby instance and you inject the string that it assembles, and uh, at least I'm a lot happier then. But if that's not easy enough, especially because you might not know all the values you want to put in in the field, uh, we have the ZB Forge library that we're working on. This, some of the functions in it now are create, which we pack it, uh, pass it the type of frame we'd like to make, and also the link variable, which you retrieve from a function like get link status. And this basically does a database query based on as little or as much information as you'd like to provide, and then does some inferencing, like what is the next sequence number that I should use to look legitimate? or what's the PAN or security mode being used here. And uh, that'll plug it in automatically. So the overall goal here that we're leading up towards is enabling easier proof of concept attacks. And uh, here you're seeing the output of a denial of service attack on AES CTR, which is one of the ZigBee security modes. It provides just confidentiality. But when you also have replay protection enabled on those devices, there's a, a known attack. This is not the first time you've seen it. Um, at least talked about in academic literature, they've talked about this, here's the implementation. Uh, you specify the channel, what source device you'd like to pretend to be, uh, if you want, what, what pan you want to act on. It will then take the inference. For example, it'll decide, hey, maybe my next sequence number should be above 119 so I don't look strange and, and so forth, who should I send it to, et cetera. 
And then it'll make that forged frame that we've highlighted in blue here, output what the packet looks like nicely. Now the code behind this is pretty easy. You do your imports, you process your command line, and then here's the actual code. Get your link status, create a packet, a data frame, based on that. And then we, these three lines just basically allow you to put other addresses in if you specify them on the command line for something you didn't search with, just to add a little more flexibility. And then here's the actual weaponization. Set your frame control field to true. You know, set your frame counter and key index to the maximum values. And this, we just wanted to show you this one because it's one of the basic attacks. It should show you how easy it is to use some of these framework tools, and we hope you'll be able to explore them further. You then just go ahead and inject using the string it creates. So that's one type of attacks and just a, a taste of what uh, some of the ones we're playing with look like. So uh, direction finding in 802.15.4 and Zigbee networks is of particular importance because of the distributed nature and mesh topology of Zigbee networks. One of the things that you, want, that you will want to do is locate devices for physical capture. Travis Goodspeed has done a lot of work on key extraction from various devices, uh, including the development of the GoodFit to facilitate this process. Pictured here is an in-home display that we actually acquired from a residential network. We used manufacturer tools to extract key information. And because the IDH uses an EM250, which doesn't use any security fuses at all, so this makes our life easier. In addition to extracting key information from the device, you could load it with your own modified firmware or mess with the sensor inputs on the device. So Joshua Wright's uh, Killer B framework offers an instant uh, RSSI meter. Our modifications to Killer B tag location, grab from a GPS, and RSSI information along with captured data packets to a database. Our upcoming tools are going to use this information for better locationing of devices uh, using known locationing techniques, which we're currently in the process of evaluating. So the hardware that we've been using are circuit boards designed for in-house development, which aren't going to hold up in the field. So what we've done is designed uh, casings for our chips to combat that. We've done everything from modifying a Pelican case to designing our, our own 3D printed enclosures, which we have a limited sample of and we'll be distributing at the end of our talk if you want one. So uh, this is a work in progress. Some of the stuff we're gonna be doing over the next uh, month or two is testing a, a larger variety of attacks against commercial devices. If you have any you'd like to volunteer, they're sometimes a little hard to get a, a hold of when you tell them what you're gonna use them for. Uh, SCAPI support for the 802.15.4 spec, we're going to be expanding and hopefully adding Zigbee as well. We'll also be porting the selective jamming to the CC2430 for lower latency, hopefully for within the same frame jamming, um, as well as doing special devices, building some devices, including ones with some robotics for automatic node finding, and then developing geographic location inferencing using time of arrival, angle of arrival, et cetera, uh, from multiple data sources to really give you a map plopped down where these Zigbee devices that you might want to borrow are. So thank you for dealing with our first SpooCon talk. Um, thank you to all the people who have helped over the development, contributed, uh, and supported us. The website up there will bring you to where our code will be posted as well as continuing updates on the project. Or we encourage you to just email us uh, directly We'll be happy to talk with you more. Thank you guys very much. Um, my clock says I have one minute, but I think uh, we'll take questions afterwards if you guys have any. Okay.